Hello there, I'm Phil, and you are watching the Blue Envelope channel from my living room. And in this video, we need to discuss Mark Sanderson. <laughs> Apologies to my boy, Johnny C. Credit where credit's due. But yes, about a year ago, boy, time flies when you're having fun. I did a video, uh, several videos on governing body member Tony Morris. Tony is my man. I have a soft spot in my heart for him. I know he says the most outrageous and most offensive things out of any of the governing body members. But personally, and this is just my opinion, I think that great passion comes with great brittleness. And I actually don't think it would take much to crack that faith and push him in the opposite direction. So I actually feel Tony might be one of the most likely governing body members to wake up. If any of them were to, the ones that scare me the most are the calm, smiling ones, David Splain, Stephen Lett in particular, so, yeah, Tony, we're waiting for you right here. But at any rate, this video isn't about Tony Morris. This video is about Mark Sanderson. It's a video I honestly was hoping that somebody else would make. Somebody maybe would pick up the mantle of these deep dives into governing body members. I personally don't really like doing them. It puts me in kind of a bad headspace. I have to become kind of obsessed to do a quality deep dive into these guys. Blech. One viewer left a comment on one of the Tony Morris videos. He says, I mean no disrespect, but either you are being paid as a disinformation agent or you have an unhealthy obsession with Tony Morris. Timothy P., I could not agree more. I am not being paid, unfortunately, as a disinformation agent. And unhealthy obsession, yes, you're probably right. That's what it takes to do these videos. That being said, I do have tremendous curiosity about the governing body members, where they came from, their histories, what makes them qualified to run this international organization with 8 million members. The details are generally fairly obscure on a lot of these men, and yeah. So, with that being said, let's take a look today at Mark Sanderson. Why did I choose him next? Um, I'm not quite sure. At least until Ken Cook joined the governing body, Mark was by far the youngest member of the governing body, and that kind of intrigued me. Also, his story is so much different than a guy like Tony Morris or Sam Hurd, who converted to Jehovah's Witnesses later in life. Mark eventually, essentially was raised in the truth and spent his entire life in full-time service, which sounded kind of boring to me initially, but I think you'll find there are some interesting aspects to his life as we go along. So let's start with Mark's parents. Who are they? Well, his father is named Douglas Crawford Sanderson. He was born in 1930, and that puts him right around 89, 90 years old today. His father was an elder, or perhaps still is an elder. His mother, her name is Grace Eleanor Sanderson. She was born in 1923. That puts her about 95 years old now. Now I'll reference a post I found on the jehovahswitness.com forum. If you're used to the XJW subreddit, jehovahswitness.com is kind of like going to the Wild West. It can get a little crazy over there. However, there are some very deep, some posters with deep, JW Histories over there. Barbara Anderson is a member, among others. And so I ran across a post from one member who posted after Mark Sanderson was initially announced as joining the governing body in 2012. 
he had some things to say. He remembered Mark Sanderson in his younger years. Now, I can't verify this information. Take it with as many grains of salt as you need to. However, there are some things mentioned in the post which lead me to believe that it is accurate. For example, he mentions correctly the names of Mark's parents, and that information has never been published by the Watchtower Society. So, again, make of it what you will, but I will reference it here a little bit. Um, and this is what the poster says in one part. Quote, his parents were the finest folks. His father, Doug, was a very kindly elder. His mother, Grace, was Canadian. She had been a pioneer in Quebec back in the 1950s when Jehovah's Witnesses were viciously persecuted by Maurice Duplessis. Grace told us that she would take her toothbrush with her when she went out in service because she never knew when she was going to be arrested and have to spend the night in jail. Unquote. So we see uh, his father, Doug, described as a very kindly elder. I did see that word pop up a couple times, that he was a kind man. And he mentions here that his mother, Grace, was Canadian. Now, again, I can't verify that, but that would, if she was from Canada, that would help to explain why Mark later chose to go to Canada as a pioneer uh, after he graduated high school. Quebec certainly was a rough time in the 1950s for Jehovah's Witnesses. Maurice Duplessis, the premier or whatever the governor is called in Canada, uh, seemed to have a personal vendetta against Jehovah's Witnesses, and it was a pretty rough time for a while up there. Now, at least since the time that Mark was born, his parents lived in San Diego, California. Initially, they lived in the city of San Diego itself. And then in 1995, when Doug and Grace were 65 and 71 years old, respectively, they sold their house that was right in the city, and they moved a little outside to Santee, California. They moved into a mobile home park there. And as far as I could tell, they have spent the next 25 years living there down to the present day, as far as I'm aware. Now, as you read the little article that Watchtower published about Mark Sanderson, it says, quote, Brother Sanderson was raised in San Diego, California, USA, by his Christian parents. And from that, you would basically think that Mark was an only child, and that's what I had assumed. However, that is actually incorrect. He has an older sister named Kim. So in 1961, Kimberly Ann Sanderson was born. That would make her about 58 years old now. And when she was born, Doug and Grace were about 31 and 37 years old, respectively. Now, what's very interesting to find out is that Kim is no longer one of Jehovah's Witnesses. And I have to assume that's why her existence has basically been scrubbed from the JW history of Mark Sanderson. It wouldn't fit in with the narrative. But indeed, he does have a sister, Kim. Uh, now, Kim went on, she got married to her husband, Darren, in 1983 at about age 22. She went to college for nursing and became a nurse in San Diego, close to my heart as a fellow nurse. In about 1993, maybe 10 years after they got married, Darren and Kim moved to Texas. Kim worked at a hospital there for three or four years. Then she began working for an OBGYN practice, and she's worked there since. She is the clinical manager for the OBGYN practice, and also helps to deliver babies. Sounds like she's probably helped deliver thousands of babies over her nursing career. Here we see a really recent photo of her with one of the physicians in the practice there. She and Darren, uh, they have three daughters. They have a few grandkids now. 
by all accounts, they seem to have a really awesome life. Now, when did Kim leave the Jehovah's Witness religion? I'm not exactly sure. I'm not sure if Darren was a witness himself at one point or not. My impression is that it happened many years ago, probably when she still was living in San Diego. I did drop a line to Kim to see if she might be willing to be interviewed on the channel because I think her story would be really interesting to listen to. Both, I mean, sure, in terms of learning a little more about her parents and about Mark's younger years, but also in terms of her own story, you know, growing up as a witness, how she left, um, what her life has been like since then, because I think it's really inspiring to see folks that leave the religion, which can be fairly traumatic, but then go on to have really fulfilling and happy lives. Who knows, maybe we can make that happen at a future time. At any rate, so Kim was born in 61. Uh, four years later, Douglas Jr. himself was born in 1965 in April. We know him today as Mark Sanderson. So yes, indeed, his actual full name is Douglas Mark Sanderson. He's Doug Jr. I assume that's why he decided to go by his middle name, Mark, just so it'd be less confusing with his dad named Doug. We do see that a little bit with the witnesses. I noticed that too with Stephen Lett does the same thing. His full name is actually Mark Stephen Lett, but he goes by his middle name, Stephen. So when, Doug, when Mark was born, he was born in 65. That makes him, him about 54 years old now. And his parents, Doug and Grace, were 35 and 41 when he was born. Well, the next time we run into Mark is when he got baptized, which the Watchtower tells us was February 9th, 1975. That would put him at just nine years old when he got baptized. He would turn 10 a couple months later. It's definitely on the, I would say, the younger end of the scale as far as when witnesses get baptized. I'm kind of curious if the fact that it was 1975 played any role. He felt like maybe he needed to get it done before Armageddon came in 75. I don't know. However, he has mentioned since then that he's glad he got baptized so young. I have a little clip here from a talk that he gave I believe it was in Germany in 2015 when he talks about getting baptized. Uh, so I'll play a little, maybe 45 second clip here. It's provided thanks to the JW Victims YouTube channel. I'll put a link to their channel for the in the description for the full video if you'd like to watch that. But let's take a look. And I have to tell you, I am so grateful that I had wonderful parents who took the time to raise me in the truth. Und aus eigener Erfahrung kann ich euch sagen, dass ich meinen Eltern dafür sehr dankbar bin, dass sie mich in der Wahrheit großgezogen haben. You know, I look down in the audience here and you're not you're not able to see all of you dear brothers who are tied in for this broadcast, but I have right in front of me brother and sister Hopkinson, brother and sister Kelsey. <coughs> Ihr könnt jetzt nicht die Zuhörerschaft sehen, die ich vor Augen habe, aber zum Beispiel hier in der ersten Reihe sitzen das Ehepaar Hopkinson und das Ehepaar Kelsey. You know, all five of us, we have something in common. Wir fünf haben etwas gemeinsam. We were all baptized between the ages of 9 and 11. Wir fünf sind gemeinsam im Alter zwischen 9 und 11 Jahren getauft worden. The best decision I ever made. Das war die beste Entscheidung, die ich je getroffen habe. Let me ask you four here. Was it the best decision you ever made? War das auch in eurem Fall die beste Entscheidung? Ja. All, all four. All four are nodding yes. Ja, wir nicken alle. Well, you know, the governing body... So those are Mark's thoughts on when to get baptized. So he's baptized at 9 and 75. Time goes by. We can assume that he graduated high school maybe in 1982, 83 area, and he began pioneering after he graduated. However, he did not take the easy route and pioneer in the awesome climate of San Diego. Instead, in September 1983, he moved to Saskatchewan, Canada. Now, why did he move to Canada? I'm not quite sure, but again, if his mom was Canadian, that would maybe help to explain how he turned his sights there. I've known a lot of 
witnesses who, you know, have moved where the need was greater over the years, but I don't think I've known anyone else that moved to Canada. So it's kind of an interesting decision there. Saskatchewan is a very rural, very spread out province in the middle of Canada with pretty brutal winters up there. I think for those of us in the U.S., we could think Montana or North Dakota, except further north. North Dakota, but more so. I can imagine that there was a great need for pioneers in that sparsely populated province, and especially brothers who were pioneers that could help take the lead in that area. Well, we next run into Mark in 1985. I'm going to go back to that forum post about Mark. In there, the poster writes that he himself moved to San Diego in 85, and that's when he met Mark because Mark was back in town for a visit. He writes, quote, Because Mark was visiting, he didn't have a car. He wanted to visit an old anointed brother up in Hemet, Melvin Sargent, if I recall, up in the mountains south of Los Angeles. So he asked us if we would like to drive him up there. So we did. We and another brother, Tony, drove up and attended a Sunday meeting, and then we were entertained at the brother's house afterwards. As I recall, this brother, like Mark, was a collector of watchtower memorabilia. Unquote. So this is a really interesting little anecdote here. Again, I can't verify it, take it with as much grains of salt as you need to. But uh, again, we see some facts that are corroborated by things in the Watchtower. Melvin Sargent was indeed an older anointed brother that lived outside of LA in Hemet. He was a uh, very, he had a long JW history. His life story actually appears in the 87 Watchtower. So you can check that out if you wanted to. He was born back in 1896. He became a coal porter. He personally knew Russell and Rutherford and everybody, basically. In 1923, he and his wife developed some health problems, so they were forced to stop the coal porter work, and they moved to Los Angeles. Now, you can recall that Rutherford lived just a little south in San Diego at Basarum. That's where his second house was. Um, and I've seen some mentions on forums that Melvin and Rutherford were friends. In fact, one post mentioned that um, once the body of, bodies of elder arrangement was dissolved and it switched to congregation servant, company servant, in the early 30s there, that Rutherford handpicked Melvin Sargent to be the first uh, congregation servant in L.A. there. So that's kind of interesting. You'll notice the forum poster mentions that this brother, like Mark himself, was a collector of Watchtower memorabilia. And that's also borne out in Watchtower literature. For example, if we look at the 75 yearbook on page 111, you notice that section in the middle there is talking about when Rutherford and the other directors went to prison. It says, a letter written by A.H. McMillan on August 30th, 1918, enables us to look behind those prison walls. A copy submitted by Melvin P. Sargent reads in part, and the letter is quoted there. So Melvin Sargent provided this letter to the society. Now, what it doesn't mention there, but I think we can safely assume that he had this letter from A.H. McMillan because McMillan was writing to Melvin Sargent. They were peers in the society at that time. And so when we say that Melvin Sargent was collecting Watchtower memorabilia, it wasn't so much that he was going on eBay or whatever and buying items. It was because he, he had lived that history and he had collected this interesting stuff as a witness himself during his lifetime. He actually lived to be 100 and he died in 1997 is an anointed brother. Now, if this anecdote is accurate, it would be really interesting to know that Mark had this friend 
of an older anointed brother that he was close enough that he would go visit him when he was back in San Diego. It really captures my interest because in Toni Morris's story, a very similar type of experience where Toni Morris also was close friends with an older anointed brother in his younger years. In fact, it was his Bible study teacher. And then both of these men, years later, decide that, you know what? I too am one of the anointed, one of the 144,000. So it's an interesting pattern, at least for the two governing body members we've looked at so far. All right, so Mark is up in Saskatchewan. We find him next in 1990. So I'm not 100% sure if he spent all seven years pioneering in Saskatchewan, but at any rate, we find him in 1990 because he was accepted to MTS, to Ministerial Training School that year. So he attended the seventh class of MTS that was held in Belleville, Michigan, and he graduated from that in December. Now in April 1991, so he's 26 years old now, he is assigned back to Canada. I think it's true that those early MTS classes, not so much the later ones, but those early ones were essentially almost like Gilead, except for single brothers, so that almost every graduate was assigned to a foreign country after the class. And that was certainly true of Mark, assigned to Canada. Canada. But instead of going back to Saskatchewan, Mark is appointed as a special pioneer to Newfoundland, and he would spend his next six years there. Now, Newfoundland, that is a very interesting place. Definitely check it out. Do some research on it. It's the pretty large island off the east coast of Canada. It only became a Canadian province in 1949, so fairly recently. Previously, it basically belonged to Britain. And today, it's still largely populated by descendants of British or Irish people. It is essentially, it kind of does its own thing. It's almost like a separate country from Canada. In fact, on a recent census, when the people were asked their nationality, some said Canadian, but quite a few actually said their nationality was Newfoundlander. It has almost its own dialect. There's a distinct way that Newfoundlanders speak. And like Saskatchewan, it's a very sparsely populated place. It's reachable from mainland Canada only by a ferry ride of about an hour and a half or flying into the island. Most of the folks on Newfoundland live on the coastline, and actually the Watchtower Society over the years has owned a number of boats to help preach to the island. I know when I first read that, I thought it sounded pretty extravagant that the society owns boats but then I read that the most expensive boat was 600 bucks, so <laughs> nothing to get up in arms about. The society over the years has actually treated Newfoundland almost as, its, as a separate country. Newfoundland had its own branch office, at least up through the 70s. Um, Gilead School would send missionary graduates to Newfoundland as their assignment. There was a missionary home on Newfoundland. Now, most of this I'm basing on the 76 yearbook, which covered the history of Newfoundland. And it's interesting, essentially since then, there's been almost zero mention in the literature of Newfoundland. So I'm not sure what's going on up there these days, if the branch is gone or the missionary home is gone, probably. But uh, at least in the 70s, there was about 1,300 witnesses on the island. So Mark was assigned there as a special pioneer in 91 and uh, eventually while he was there he also started filling in as a substitute CO from time to time. What you really notice looking at Newfoundland and even Saskatchewan for that matter is that they seem like fairly solitary lonely assignments for a witness and especially not for a couple, but Mark being a single guy up there, I can really picture a lot of time spent by yourself, you know, thinking about things, doing personal study. 
And eventually he comes to the conclusion that he is one of the anointed. When did he decide that? I'm not exactly sure, and you can feel free to disagree with me, but I, my best guess is that it was while he was in Newfoundland. And I see that because looking at Toni Morris's life story, it was after he started partaking and came out as anointed that he was pulled off the road as a circuit overseer and brought in to start working at Bethel. And it's similar for Mark that he spends about six years special pioneering substitute CO in Newfoundland, and then he's pulled out to be reassigned to Canada Bethel in February 1997. Now remember, at this point, he is 31 years old and a partaker is my conclusion. Uh, that is stupendously young to be <laughs> partaking of the emblems at the memorial. It had to take some guts, some deep conviction was operating there. Remember the articles which proposed the idea that, you know, maybe the anointed weren't sealed in 1935, that there might still be new anointed being collected. Those articles didn't start appearing, I think, until around 2007. So a good 10 years after Mark was being a partaker. So here he is, a 31-year-old guy uh, saying he's anointed. I mean, I can only assume that he was probably getting some fairly strong counsel or criticism from other witnesses about what does this young buck think he's doing? This is a bunch of baloney. <laughs> but he is stuck to his guns, and I guess you could say it worked out pretty well for him. Well, at this point in Mark's story, we have a period which I kind of think of as the business executive time. It really reminds me of when I worked at a Cummins engine plant in Jamestown, New York. Now, Cummins is a huge multinational company. They make diesel engines for trucks. They have factories all over the world. And how it works there for business executives, they would essentially be assigned to one plant and run it for about three years. Then if they did well at that assignment, they would be rotated out and they would get another assignment, hopefully a promotion. So they would become vice president of something or other or plant manager at a bigger plant. They do that for a couple, three years. Then they would move on to some other assignment, you know, each way, each time working their way higher up the corporate ladder until they were president or whatever of the company. So that's what I saw in Jamestown, that every couple of three years, there would be a new plant manager brought in from outside to kind of prove his mettle to Cummins. And we see a very similar process with Mark starting here in 1997. Even though Mark was anointed and a special pioneer. It wasn't like they were going to put him on the governing body at that point. He needed to kind of prove his mettle or what does the Bible say? Be tested as to fitness first. And so he begins this time period of rotating through various assignments, variously gradually ascending through the Watchtower organization and seeing how he does at each level. So he's pulled into Canada Bethel and he spends about three years working there. I'm not sure what his assignment was, but evidently it went well. And so in 2000, he's promoted to Brooklyn Bethel. He's about 34 years old at this point. And he spends about eight years in Brooklyn Bethel. So he's initially works in hospital information services. Uh, after that, he was promoted to the service department and he worked there for some time period. Evidently, that went well. He did acquitted himself well in those assignments. And so in September, at two, uh, September 2008, so he's about 43 years old now, he initially goes through the eight-week course of the School for Branch Committee Members, which is held at Patterson. And after graduating, he's assigned and spends the next two service years as a Branch Committee member in the Philippines. So he does that for two years. Evidently that went well for him. And so in September 2010, the start of that service year, he's rotated back to 
Bethel and receives a promotion here. Now he's a helper to the service committee of the governing body. So at that point, he is 45 years old when he takes that position. He spends two service years in that role. Again, evidently everything goes well there. And finally, he's appointed to the ultimate role, governing body itself, in September 2012 at 47 years old. Mark spent about 17 rather lonely years, I think we can assume, up in the wilds of Canada. But since joining the governing body, he has made up for lost time traveling around the globe on many trips as, a, as the face of the organization, as a governing body member. Just a few examples. In January of 2014, we find him in Sri Lanka giving the branch dedication talk there. In March of 2014, we find him back in the U.S. He actually gave Guy Pierce's funeral talk, Guy Pierce of the Governing Body. In January 2015, we find him in Madagascar giving the dedication talk for the branch expansion there. In September 2015, we find him in Kampala, Uganda, releasing the New World Translation in the Luganda language at the convention there. In 2016, we find him giving a talk at a branch visit in Spain. And so it goes, and in addition to traveling around the world, he's also appeared in a decent number of JW Broadcasting episodes. Mark has indeed had an interesting life as one of Jehovah's Witnesses. I think what really jumps out to me the most in checking out his history is his sister Kim, not just because she's a nurse, but because like many XJWs, I have family that are still witnesses, and often on my mind is that question of, will they ever wake up and leave the organization? Well, I think the Sanderson story tells us, you know what? You just never know what will happen in the future. So think positive, because here we have a family that was so spiritual that one of the children becomes a governing body member and is running the witness organization. The second child, with the exact same spiritual upbringing, left the witnesses and is not a witness anymore. So you just never know what's going to happen even from very hardcore spiritual families. And so the important thing is, don't give up hope. But that's about all I wanted to cover with you today. Please leave a comment below what you think about all of this. Don't forget to subscribe to the John Cedars channel for more such videos. And, oh wait. Ah. And as always, thank you for watching.